All right, hey everyone, this is Nico from Nebula Photos. I'm here with Kevin Boucher, who is showing me his backyard observatory. So how long have you had this observatory, Kevin? I've had it uh, going on, I'd say maybe 22 years now, wow. which really amazes me, to yeah. be honest with you. Because um, I got it uh, shortly after I got into astrophotography, and that was with, believe it or not, a Me DSI when they first came out. Yeah. And that, that was a color CCD, maybe 640 pixels across? Exactly, yeah. exactly. Very, very small. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> sort of like a webcam, but yes. designed for astroimaging. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And of course, my pictures were horrid, you know. Sure. I mean, but I was thrilled to death to get anything. For me, it was like what you hear most astrophotographers say. Um, they wanted to show people what it is that they were looking at through an eyepiece. And uh, so that was my reasoning, and that's how I got started in it. How long were you visual before you got that Mead DSI? Uh, I'd say I probably was visual for maybe four years, something like that. Cool. Yeah. But the, but building the observatory was sort of you even back then you were th sort of thinking like oh well this will be really nice for astrophotography. Oh absolutely, yeah. it was all because of astrophotography yeah. because primarily, you know, just the first year and a half even where I was setting up take, spending all that time getting polar alignment and trying to get everything just right and the equipment I had wasn't great to begin with so that just made things even worse right so. It was really nice to be able to come out and have everything ready to go right out of the gate. And you could really just get start to the business at hand of taking pictures instead of spending so much time on prep. Yeah. So that was, that's what it was all about for me, you know. And you were telling me that this is based on the Skyshed plans. So 22 years ago, they already had those available somehow? Yes, they did. Yeah, they were available online. Uh, not only did I buy the plans, I also bought that Skyshed Pier that's in there, which has been rock solid. I mean, you know, it, use, it could use a little paint now, I think. But yeah, it's been there a long time and it's worked perfectly. And then you were telling me that at some point, um, the all sort of wood construction for the extension didn't work out. Could you tell that story again and, and sort of uh, how far into the 22 years was that and what was going on there? It was probably 10 years before the, um, the wooden rails um, started to twist a little bit. So it started to check and the roof was a little harder to move in and out. And, you know, the clincher... Um, you know, one night when I was trying to close the roof, it was late. Um, it was before I started automation, like I'm doing now. Uh, I was so I was closing up every night, and uh, and I was having a hard time closing it. And, you know, I had it open, but I was having a hard time closing it. So I put my knee on the wall and started pulling on the handle, and I my you know my grip let go or something. The next thing you know, I I I woke up on the floor of the observatory, uh, out cold. I don't know how long I was there. It's, to this day, I don't know how long I was there. Uh, what happened is when I fell backwards, I hit my head on that metal pier and uh, put a good gash in there. And so anyways, at the time, I didn't know how badly I was hurt, but uh, I walked into the house. My, my wife was asleep, but I, I woke her up. I says, could you check my head? I think I, I might be bleeding a little bit. She freaked out because I literally had blood all over my face, all over everywhere. You know, and I was in a daze. I didn't quite know what was going on. So next thing you know, it was a quick ride to the emergency room um, and had to get. I don't remember how many stitches, but it was quite a few. Yeah. yeah. So and obviously they had to check for you know a concussion. You know, if you do any damage, even more than my brain already. So yeah. Uh, yeah. So and that was the that was the kicker. Yeah. That was, <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And so, um, and then you you had this, uh, or did, was this sort of your first thought? Is is making this all out, out of metal, and and how did that come about? Um, well, I, I you know I have a very very good friend of mine who I've I've known for almost fifty years, and he works down um, in Worcester um, area, and he works with a welder down there that is kind of like, almost like a master welder. You can basically work with any material. And, uh, you know, I was asking him about the idea of, do you think he'd be interested in, um, you know, putting, you know, the four inch square channel type aluminum beams together for me? Because I know those will never, ever check. Um, they've got nice thermal properties. Not that I've ever seen or read anybody that has done this before, but I just knew inherently this would be a good solution for me. I, I did get sticker shock when I heard the price for, you know, not only for the aluminum, but for the, you know, the installation, all the welding work and everything. 
But in the end, honestly, it was really worth it to me. I mean, it's been rock solid ever since I've done it. It will never, ever need to be adjusted or anything. It just works perfectly. And like you've seen in the videos, or you will see in the video, that uh, it's just so easy to open and close. And I don't ever have to worry about anything moving again on me. And they did all the work. I mean, what was nice is not only did they weld that frame, but they did, they, they removed the wooden um, base rails inside uh, under the roof that were holding the roof up to replace it with the powder-coated steel uh, channel that they put in. And the reason why they use steel instead of aluminum is because the, uh, it was steel um, that was holding the, the wheels, you know, that everything's gliding on. And you can't weld steel to aluminum, so, um, so they, they use steel. But what they did to prevent it from rotting is they, uh, they powder-coated the inside and the outside of it um, after they welded all everything on. So it was... Um, you know, so it still looks like it's brand new. But is there anything else that um, you would have done differently or that you've had to change over the years with the observatory? Actually, no. I don't. I can't think of anything. I think uh, I'm really happy I went with the roll-off. Mm -hmm. um, I know I have a lot of friends that are using um, domes. And, you know, there's a whole issue of syncing automation between the scope, you know, between your peer and... Uh, and I'm sorry, the mount and the, and, you know, your little slat opening there. And, you know, it's nice not having to deal with that part of, you know, um, the automation part of things, you know. So they have to be out there all night constantly moving their dome or, you know, monitoring things, whereas I don't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. I've thought about putting motorized uh, opener on the roof, but I just don't know if I would really need to use it much. Um, I pretty much, the way I work is... I will come out here maybe while it's still light, two or three hours before dark. Um, I will set up my, my uh, laptop, uh, plug everything in, get it started. Nina is what I use. Uh, it basically knows when to start the process of imaging around astronom astronomical dusk, although I do some camera cooling a little before that. But um, I don't need to be out here. I basically use TeamViewer. That's what I use to monitor what's going on out here on my laptop. And also that camera allows me to see, like, if I want to watch what's going on when it's first pointing to a target so that I make sure no ca uh, cable snags are going on, which hopefully I won't have anymore with my new setup. Um, I, I, I look at that on my computer inside the house. And then from that point on, it's running all night long. I wait for that first picture to come through to see if everything looks good and focusing looks good. And, and I let it run all night. When I wake up in the morning, I, I go out and my scope's parked. Mm -hmm. um, I come out and I basically shut everything down and close the roof. Um, I don't honestly know if I would need to do it any other way. Because if I was going to automate the opening of the roof, then I would get into maybe needing a cloud sensor because now would you open the roof if you had any issues with clouds? Do you want to close the roof if the, you know, if there are clouds coming, you know? So it just adds a lot more complexity. Sure. Um, so, and I'm, you know, I know you can work out the, because I've, I've done all the map, you know, the figuring it out myself in terms of what's involved with the sensors and stuff. So your sensors are such so that you're not going to hit your telescope um, when the roof is closing with the motor, you know, stuff like that. But still, you know, I just, I, I guess I don't need that extra step. And the automation I have, I'm happy with. Well, thanks so much for talking with me, Kevin. This is an amazing observatory, and I'm, I'm glad to see one working after 20 years, you know, because a lot of the ones I've visited have been more recent installations, so it's cool to see an older one. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, I, I, I love it, you know, and it's, some, it's a, it, you, as you know, it's a hobby that you, you never get tired of. Um, and it's something you can do the rest of your life, you know. So hopefully I'll be in this house for a long time and um, I'll make good use of this. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you.